Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Across the Sky podcast, Lee Enterprises National Weather Podcast. We are in 77 newsrooms all across the country, all corners of the country, but we are not talking about the United States today. We are going across the pond over to Europe and the Mediterranean Sea to talk about Medicanes. Sounds like a hurricane. Almost is like a hurricane, but it's what they see in the Mediterranean Sea. We are going to chat with Dr. Costas Lagovardos, a research director from the National Observatory in Athens, Greece, all about it. You know, guys, I was poking through the Bolton, the American Meteorological Society. Shout out to the American Meteorological Society. They, uh, they do uh, wonders for the weather community. We love being a part of it. And I saw this, this piece called Ianos, a hurricane in the Mediterranean. I said, geez, I said, yeah, I feel like this would be a good podcast topic because a lot of us can relate to hurricanes. We've either been in one or we've seen plenty of it, you know, on our screens, but it's a little different. You don't expect hurricanes in the Mediterranean. And there's some differences, but Kostas is going to talk to us about those differences. You know, I think uh, I, I think he did a good job explaining it, but I'll turn it over to my weather friends here across the country. Sean Sublet, the Richmond Times Dispatch and Matt Holliner over in the midwest we'll start with you matt here um th did you know much about medicanes before this topic no not until you brought it up i was like hurricanes in the mediterranean uh that that's new to me but this isn't a new thing and i looked into it and like oh no these have occurred before but the difference is it really caught everybody's attention in 2020 when they had an intense one well, actually reached category two hurricane string most of the time it's kind of like tropical storms. There have been a few that have been at category one strength, but a lot of times they stay out in the water, and so they're not impacts the land. They tend to be weak, but that seems to be changing, and uh, that's what we're bring them on the podcast because they have one that made landfall with category two strength, and suddenly there are big impacts, and uh, it looks like there might be a, a trend that way in the increasing intensity, so we might have to start paying attention to them a little bit closer in the future. And uh, Sean, you seem to know about everything weather at all time. You're, you're, you're the expert here of the three of us. Uh, did, did you know about it? I had heard of Medicaid's. One of the things that I'm not as well versed on is, is the formation of them. I think we all understand what a tropical cyclone is. It's deriving it, its energy from, from warm water, right? But there are other kind of physical restrictions going on. You know, the Mediterranean Sea is smaller uh, than, than the Atlantic Ocean and, and the Gulf of Mexico. The, the geography is different. You've got, you've got islands poking in from all directions. You've got Italy jutting southward from the continent. Um, and the other thing that, that I wasn't well versed on either was how warm does the Mediterranean get? In my own mind, I thought, well, it, it ought to get pretty warm. Does it get as warm as, as the Gulf of Mexico? So we talked a little bit about that. Um, so there, there are some restrictions going on here physically. So those were the things that I was was most curi curious about. He really addressed those well, I thought. I think he uh, he did a good job with this. You know, there is a little bit of a accent here. You know, we are talking to uh, to Kostas, who lives in Greece. But I'll tell you what, uh, he knows almost as much English as all of us, and he definitely knows a lot more uh, English than I know Italian. So I I'll give him credit to that. But fantastic interview. We're going to dive right into it here. Here is Kostas talking all about Medicaid in the Mediterranean. And now we welcome on Dr. Costas Lagovardos. He is the research director for the National Observatory of Athens and the Institute for Environmental Research in Athens, Greece. It is just about noon our time here in America. He is joining us this evening. He's, he's going to go to dinner afterwards. Uh, but we appreciate you coming on the podcast here today, Costas, and talking to us all about Medicaid. Thanks for, thanks for the invitation. It's an honor for me to to be part of this discussion and explain you to be what's happening in the Mediterranean. Yes, okay. uh, and, and we're very happy to have you. We're happy to go international too, uh, as well as we, as we talk about this. So we talked a little bit about this in the introduction about uh, the Medicanes before we had you on here. But you know, the storm that you focused on in, in your in your research study was called. I, am I saying it right? Ionos. Is that the right yeah, way to say? Yes. It? Okay. Ionos. Okay. Yes. So uh, you titled it Ionos, a hurricane in the Mediterranean. And, you know, this storm was strong. I mean, you know, for people who are here in the United States listening, I mean, this took place in September of 2020. Unfortunately, four people died. 
1,400 landslides in two days from this. And maximum sustained winds were 98 miles an hour. And to give you an idea of how strong that is, that's like a Category 2 hurricane. So this was immensely strong. And, and I want to, we will get into that storm. But from my understanding, you've been studying these Medicanes since, be, since the 20th century. So for over 20 years now. So what got you interested in this, this little field of Medicanes? What got you interested in it? One the thing is that this is part of the major weather events that we investigate. We're not investigate only Medicanes, but also severe storms, or severe thunderstorms, or, um, even heat waves, because uh, unfortunately heat wave also is a, it's a, it's a natural disaster and uh, a silent killer. But anyway, let me go to the Medicanes. When I was young and I started my work in, at the observatory, at the time, the first satellite images of uh, some Medicaid, it was a Medicaid in 1995, if I remember well. So it's very, um, it's almost 30 years ago. And uh, it was something fascinating because it was like something, it was something like a small hurricane, but a small one in the middle of the Mediterranean. And uh, it was one of the first made the game as we investigated at the time in 1995 and then a lot of people, scientists in the Mediterranean countries from Spain, Italy and Greece started investigating medicaments and but now we have after this period of almost 30 years we have a lot of track of medicaments investigating medicaments for many scientists in, in Europe and the Mediterranean more than 20 that are Investigate that are we investigated in full, and the last one because it was the biggest happened was Ianos. It we were we put a lot of interest to Ianos because first of all it was affecting Greece, and then because uh, we we realized from the beginning of its formation that something might be happening in the next days. We we'll discuss it a little bit later on this one, and finally yes it was indeed a very powerful. Medicaid, and according to the records have so far, it was the most intense with category two sustained winds. If we take the Saffir Simpson scale, were you in Greece when this was happening? What was it like yes. actually being there? Yes, yes, I got I was in Greece. We have two, two years ago in 2018, we have another one, similar one, which is a little bit more or less intense. But it was a little bit peculiar because it affected more or less the same areas. It moved from northern Africa to Greece and then back to, uh, again, to, to, toward the south. But this one was, finally, was very, very mm, powerful. Fortunately, we have four casualties in central Greece. And as uh, you said, landslides uh, flattened in many areas, very, very high winds and storm surges in the western part of Greece, the part that... Uh, it's uh, towards Italy, with Italy and Greece, and um, it was a good opportunity to because now we have many, many tools to investigate Medicare. We have more satellites. I will explain later on because we have the, the chance to have a good satellite overpassing the medic, this Medicare. We have very good models. We have many more surface observations in order to to follow the evolution of the Medicaid and see what is happening and understand uh, what's happening inside the Medicaid, which is not uh, 100% known to the moment. And Kostas, to put things in perspective uh, for our audience, what is the frequency like for these Medicaid? Like how often do they occur? How rare of a situation is this? Well, more or less one or two per year in the Mediterranean. Most of them are the western part of the Mediterranean, towards Spain, uh, Balearic Islands, Sicily, and Corsica. But also we have on the area between Italy and Greece, like Ianos, it's very seldom, almost non-existent to have uh, Medicaid on the eastern part of the Mediterranean, uh, towards Cyprus uh, and the Middle East. Um, one or two per year, with uh, some of them are moving only over the water, so there's not a threat for people, although have many islands in the running, and sometimes they're affected by many things. And then uh, we have this one, which uh, hit continental Greece, and also the islands of Greece, and uh, gave, and provoked a lot of problems uh, in this area. And uh, But it's one, of, one or two, but again, the intensity of this, of the, of this rough piano was of 
something uh, which was never seen uh, so far in the Mediterranean. Costas, um, Sean here in Virginia. So when we think about tropical cyclones here in the eastern part of North America, you know, we think about the classical hurricanes and how they can grow to such a large size. Uh, I imagine there are going to be spatial constraints there in the Mediterranean. Uh, but are these exclusively warm core tropical cyclones? Are they hybrids? Uh, and the other question I have for you is, how warm does the Mediterranean get during the, the warmest part of the summer? They are, they are, they, uh, these are these against are warm core cycling, but they are not uh, it, difference with uh, the hurricanes. They are not um, influenced so much by the sea surface temperature. The surface temperature in the Mediterranean can go up, up to 28 uh, degrees, uh, 26 to 28, but this is not the, the main mechanism. Uh, usually, we have uh, upper lows, uh, cold air, aloft, warmer air, of course. At the bottom, we have a flow, a flow of moisture from the sea surface towards um, the cyclone. We have condensation, the release of heat. We we'll have a warm core near the, near the, near the surface. And uh, it's, they look like hurricanes, but the mechanism is not actually the same. Uh, second, not, they're not, they, they don't have the same size, okay? A diameter of metric cans could be between uh, 100 to 100 kilometers. It's uh, maybe one tenth of a big hurricane. We don't cover the size to cover full development. But for the size of the Mediterranean basin, they are big enough. But as I said before, we are not, we don't have so far, many a, 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 a concrete definition of, of a Mediterranean. And also, all the mechanisms related to the mechanics are not very well known because we don't have all the tools we need to investigate the mechanics. For example, we have hurricane, you have all their plants crossing hurricanes to make radar measurements, release drop zones, and have all these measurements. Unfortunately, this does not exist at the Mediterranean, and so we re rely on models, but also on satellite imagery, which in the case of we're very lucky because we have um, a passage from uh, a U.S. Japan satellite, the Global Precipitation Mission, GPM, and we have very, very good snapshots, 3D structure from the weather, from the radar that's on board the satellite during the Enos. We were very, very lucky because we have a very good image from GPM satellite during the intense phase of, of this medication. So you're really getting, like you said, from satellites and, you know, observational equipment on the ground here. And, you know, you kind of point out how crucial our hurricane hunters are and our aircraft is <laughs> in the United States to track these storms. They provide, you know, a wealth of data every time they go out there. It's not cheap, but it's worth it to help really, you know, like, you know, as you were kind of alluding to, to get a full picture of the storm. My question is, are there either government agencies or universities out there that are talking about getting some hurricane aircraft into these storms. Is that is that something, is there a push for that over uh, across the pond here in Europe? There is a great interest, but I don't think they have any mean. We have some researcher claims in Europe, okay, but uh, it's a little bit difficult to, because the phenomenon is a little bit rare. That's a problem. You take care once or once or two per year, uh, one year cannot be a good chance of to have any, any medication at all. So this is a problem. But I think we have, we must do it because uh, uh, we can also use this type of measurement, not only for medication, but also for normal low pressure systems, but also in the Mediterranean are very powerful. For meteorological bombs that are not very gains, but also they have very high sustained winds and they can provoke problems. Uh, in uh, the, but um, the case we need data to better understand because I remember because one of our work on the observatories was to provide forecast to the public and also to to the authorities together with the med service. And I remember when we. The event lasted seven days, and in the beginning there was a cluster of thunderstorms on uh, on the over on the coast of North Africa, and then we started discussion according to the model if this will be developed and built 
uh, medicated or not. It's quite a little bit similar with the discussion we have in the US, for example, we have a tropical depression coming from Africa, if this will become a hurricane or not uh, on the path to, to the US. And uh, to be honest, it was uh, a night forecasters for this and what will happen. It will be a fellow medic cane. And then when we saw from the satellite image etc that a medic cane was formed, we have this spiral and the clouds spiraling around the center, the cloud free area in the middle, like a small hurricane. And then the second one, as we have in the message, which will be the path. If this medicane will affect Greece or not, which part, and it was very heavily mediatized all these uh, these things because all people were uh, following uh, forecasts provided by Greek forecasters to see what will happen in the next one or two days. Public authorities, municipalities were as you know, in some cases, because something is rare and it was presented like the end of the world, okay? So like uh, apocalypse in, 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 from some the media. Apocalypse. Yeah, apocalypse from, from, from uh, yeah. apocalypse from my media, but okay, it was a very strong case. And we have to, to reply on that. What will happen? When this uh, medicare will make landfall to the western part of Greece, to the southern part, it will stay over the sea, so there's no problem. It was a difficult situation from the forecasting point of view. And, you know, we, we still see challenges here in the United States with forecasting and messaging impacts, and, you know, we see these all the time. So it's a shared concern all across the globe, it sounds like. here. We're going to get into more about Medicaid's here. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back to you on the Across the Sky podcast. All right, and we are back here with the Across the Sky podcast. New episodes every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts or on your favorite newsrooms website here. We have Sean Sublet, I'm Joe Martucci, Matt Hollander here, and we are here with Costas Lagovardos from the uh, National Observatory of Athens in Greece. We were talking about Medicaid's. Um, Matt, I know you had a question to lead on and off, so I'm going to kick it over to you, buddy. What do you got? Yeah, I want to know what you know, kind of goes into the preparation for these storms. Obviously, they're not super frequent, but they do occur. So I kind of want to know what the attitude is for people who live along the Mediterranean and maybe how it's changed some now that we've had a significant one that hit in 2020. So kind of t- describe the the level of preparation and the attitude that folks along the Mediterranean had before and after that storm when it comes to these Medicaid's. Yes, well, I... I think that the ENOS changed the mentality of people against uh, speaking about natural disasters in uh, in general because it was something which was big. It was for casualties. In some cases, you have more than for casualties from, how, for example, three years ago, from supercell thunderstorms, seven casualties. But uh, as you understand, uh, this is not only the number of casualties, but also the extent of the event covered most of Greece and also the, the virus happened in many, many places. So I think many people remember Ianos and they speak uh, about Ianos and the, as, as in, as I would say, as uh, a threat for the future that uh, we'll discuss a little bit later on that, but uh, this kind uh, this kind of, uh, this weather, this weather situation like Ianos will be something that of the future will be more frequent. This is not true, but we'll discuss a little later, later on. Uh, the, um, uh, but I told you, because it was a, a long process, you have this formation of the cluster, of the thunderstorm cluster, and then the formation of the initial stage of the Medicaid. And there was a, a, many discussions, the forecasters to the public, what will happen? And there was some preparation. That, and, and I think that we avoid many problems, especially in the western part of Greece, the island, because there was a preparation for this for this uh, Medicaid, because it was in September, uh, mid-September, which is for this still a touristic season. We have also many tourists that are boats, on sailing boats or vacation homes, and but uh, we avoided big problems and uh, maybe a lot of casualties because we have a good uh, uh, preparation of this uh, for this event. But for many people, this. Uh, Word medigain and the resemblance with hurricane 
it gave, it gave them the fear that something very bad will happen. And this fear made them more precautions and they, were, they took some precautions and we avoided many casualties, <laughs> maybe due to this um, uh, room where we have about something very bad will happen. This. And as you understand, because there are a lot of discussions that we, uh, it's something, I will be game something like American, how hurricanes like, like, season, we, like in the Atlantic, we try to expand that this is not true, it's something different, it's violent, but it's more, and it's something that we have to pay attention to when we have such kind of events. They are rare, as you said, but when they are there, they make a lot of noise and a lot of, they cause a lot of problems. I, I want to ask about the names. They had Ianos here. How, how are the, who is naming these storms? Uh, we started in the observatory to give names to storms in January 2017. And uh, uh, the name Ianos was given by me, okay, by myself. And uh, as the head of the group of uh, the meteorological group at the National Observatory of Athens. So uh, we followed to the same strategy, uh, female and male names alphabetically. So we came to I, and so we came to the name Ienos, which uh, is a Latin god. Uh, and uh, I think it was a good name. And, uh, after that, um, this is a little bit gossip, but I will tell you that. The We're here for we it. Started, yes, when we started giving names, uh, some uh, colleagues from the National Met Service, they were not very happy. They said that this is not uh, very common in Europe, or they are doing that in the US, but not in Europe. And we said, no, uh, giving names for big storms is something that helps people to be more uh, prepared against the problem. And But uh, one year from ago, they decided to follow this uh, procedures and they started giving names by themselves. The National Med Service is now giving names for storms in, in Greece. Uh, but we paved the way, I think, and we start to make this initiative, give names to storms. And I think it's uh, it's proven that it's good, not only for us, because we remember the cases, but also for the general public. When we give names, provide names to, to weather event, people pay attention to, to this event. This sounds a lot like winter storm naming here in America. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, Costas, but the, the National Weather Service does not name winter storms. However, the Weather Channel does. So it's a little but different like because for a uni Yeah, you know, I'm talking about. So, you know, <laughs> you're a university and, and it's the government. So it's a little different than a private and a public service here. But it's kind of amazing how quickly... Uh, the the government took over the naming. I, I, it, it, yes, yes. I don't know if it happens that after four people. years of naming. At the, in the beginning, because I have some colleagues writing to the social media, the Facebook, uh, what, why you are doing that? It's uh, we're not in America, and uh, uh, we try to persuade them that this is something good. And finally, they understood that, and they started naming the storms in 2020. Wow. So we said, no, we will not give both both institute names because it will be make a confusion. Okay, we step back and say, okay, go ahead, give names. The, the but the main idea that we have to use us for winter storms, autumn storms, I think it was correct. Got it. Yeah, I'm totally on board with that. So let me ask you this as as the awareness of these systems has has risen a bit over the past few years and we know that that the climate is warming. What, what do you kind of foresee or what does the science tell us about these storms taking shape in the Mediterranean in terms of their frequency or intensity, potentially, uh, in the years or even decades to come? Before that, we have a look on what happened the last 30 years and we see that we have a frequency of not one or two per year with no significant trend decreasing or increasing. This is true because we have measures. And then we come to the climatic projections based on high resolution climatic models. And we have some colleagues from other Mediterranean countries that made uh, some publications and they show that over the next decades, the frequency will not increase or decrease, but the, the, the intensity will. And we expect maybe the same number of an average per year of uh, mid gains but maybe we'll be more in depth. This is related to high temperature, high, high surface temperature. And uh, 
we will see, but as you understand, these projections is something that we are taking the account because one or two, but more powerful and more powerful than this one, and this one was a category two, if we go to category three, and this will be a problem because okay, the, the major path of this many cases are over the sea, but as, as I told you before, have many islands okay, over the Mediterranean, so have people living there, and especially people navigating small ships from one island to the other, so this would be a problem to have. But to have bigger, small, stronger, more dense uh, medigains. But I believe that um, uh, using the modern technology, satellite, and more sophisticated knowledge will be able to provide more accurate forecast for the path and the intensity of the medigains in the future. And Kostas, I think, I think we'll leave off with this. I have one more question for you. Have you spoken with the National Hurricane Center here in America about this topic? Have you had, or even just any conversation with them? No, no. no. And maybe, it's a, maybe it's a mistake from my side, from our side to do that. We, we can spoke connect with you. The, <laughs> yes, yes. Last thing, I think it's a fascinating topic, Medicaid. It's okay. It's not good to say fascinating, something that kills people, okay, and make a lot of um, disaster. But uh, from a meteorological point of view, it's something that we, which is very attractive and we learn things and the way we are happy as i said before we have new satellites that provide data that uh, 20 years ago was unthinkable and so this is good for the future because i think that many with more uh, tools with more uh, remote sensing data and and meteorological models will be able to better understand the mechanism of the medication, therefore better predict a medication. Well, Kostas, thank you so much for joining us here uh, on an evening for you. Uh, I know you're going to dinner, so enjoy thank dinner, you. but we appreciate thank the information about medicaines. And if you ever make it over to uh, the United States, give us a call. We'll do something in person. Okay, thank you. Thanks thanks again for the kind invitation. Okay, yeah, thank we're you. very happy to do it. Thank you very much. We're going to take one more break while we'll some closing thoughts on the Across the Sky podcast. Looking beyond the atmosphere, here's Tony Rice with your astronomy outlook. This Wednesday morning, May 17th, the lunar occultation will occur as the moon passes in front of Jupiter. This event will be visible from the Rocky Mountains east, with best visibility coming from points further north and west. The show begins around 8.30 a.m. Eastern, 6.30 Central, 5.30 Mountain, as Jupiter slides behind the left side of the crescent moon. About an hour later, it will re-emerge on the right side. It's that re-emergence that's the cool part, because Jupiter will seem to appear out of nowhere as it was behind that unlit part of the moon. This will be a bit challenging to see, since it's about an hour after sunrise. A pair of binoculars could help. Just make sure to avoid the sun. Those timings can vary by about 15 minutes, mostly depending on latitude. Visit lunar-occultations.com, that's O-C-C-U-L-T-A-T-I-O-N-S, and check the table there for a city near you. Be sure to convert from the UTC times there to your local time zone. That's your Astronomy Outlook. Follow me at RTP Hokey for more spacey stuff like this. Thanks again to Kostas for coming on. Um, it was fantastic to, number one, work around our schedule here a little bit. I know we have a seven-hour time difference between uh, the East Coast, the U.S., and Greece, but uh, we thank him for his knowledge. And, uh, you know, I it was a little funny at the end where he was like, I was the one who decided to name the storms. You know, he kind of that set off a trend where we're now the equivalent of the National uh, Weather Service or the National Hurricane Center is issuing names for these storms. So a heavy hitter in the weather world, really, uh, if you put it that way. What'd you take away from this, Matt? Yeah, it would be cool if I could name a storm. That that, that does say, when he said that, it's like, oh, actually I'd named it. I was like, oh, that's that's pretty <laughs> cool. I gotta, I gotta give credit there. But you know, the other thing that stood out to me is that, you know, in the communication realm, like people do like the names of these hurricanes. And then there's a debate on if we should be naming the winter storms or not either. But I think that might, this is probably coming up in discussion because of the intensity. And that's what was interesting because it kind of follows what we're seeing in the Atlantic too. There's some uncertainty about the frequency. It doesn't seem like there's a steady trend in an, an increase in number of storms that we have had some active seasons. 
uh, in the Atlantic. But what the climate models are telling us is that what does seem to be locked is an increase in the intensity. And that's why they had the first one to ever make it to category two strength before. And really, that's what really matters, because if these things are weak, uh, then it's not a big deal. But when they're intense, that's when the impacts go up. So if there's an increase in intensity, even if the frequency doesn't go up, that means there's the bigger potential for impact. So it's uh, definitely going to be something that I think people are going to be keeping a closer eye on as we move ahead in the future. Yeah, I agree with that. Most of the most of it is is intensity more than frequency, right? If you if you think back to to the basic thermodynamics of it all, you know you are going to have warmer water, uh, and so you are going to have more fuel for for not just any tropical cyclone, but you think extra tropical or these hybrid storms. Sometimes they're called subtropical storms they're still getting energy from warm water. So I, I do think there's something to be said for that, and they're going to put down heavier rain, and you've got some pretty some pretty steep terrain there on the islands and, and right around and in the Mediterranean. So, you know, flooding, flash flooding, mudslides, those things are still going to have to be, to be dealt with in the years and decades to come. Yeah, I think he said it was about, you know, every, I think, what do you say? How in terms of the frequency, about four a year? Is that what he said? Well, I think he said maybe a couple a year, but you know, two, three, four. That's that's still not a lot. No, it's, it's like not. Here in the, it's not like here in the Atlantic Basin where we're, we're typically looking at at least ten or fifteen of something every year. Yeah, right. And exactly. Then, and there's multiple countries. There's a Spanish yeah. part to you know the Mediterranean, so it's not that often that one country is seeing you know this Medicaid come on through here. But, it, you know, thanks again to Costas. We went international uh, with this one. And uh, we'll try to bring some more people around the globe to you on the Across the Sky podcast. So coming up, uh, the hits keep on coming here. So next week, uh, we have Adam Smith from NOAA's National Centers of Environmental Information to talk about weather disasters, billion-dollar weather disasters to be exact. We have a big fish for the 29th episode. We have... Uh, the director of the National Hurricane Center. Uh, we also have Mike Svetis from Front Page Bets. That's in collaboration with us at Lee Enterprises. Talk about sports betting and baseball as well. And then I am super, super, super <laughs> excited for this one. Now, this one's not going to be until <laughs> July 3rd. But we have George Shea from Major League Eating, the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest personal hero of mine in some ways the biggest hype man on planet earth we're gonna have him come on to talk about the hot dog eating contest and the weather so we really try to bring you everything weather related on the across the sky podcast i think we might be the most diverse weather podcast out there in terms of guests i don't know if sean and matt you agree with me or not if we're talking about major league eating yeah we we've reached a new level it's uh <laughs> it's gonna be an interesting one we there's have, some kind have. of level. There's some kind of level we've reached there, but I'm but, not exactly sure how I would describe that level. Right. We'll leave that. We'll leave that to you, the listeners. Well, we will leave that to the listeners to decide what level we have aspired to or sought to when we talk about a hot dog eating contest. That, that that's right. <laughs> and and, uh, and as we go into July, uh, where we believe uh, here's the language will be back with us too. Yeah. Uh, from Paternity Leap, as we uh, as we welcome her back, and she's doing very well. Uh, with her and a new baby as well. So we want to wrap up on that note and we will be back with you next Monday with Adam Smith. Take care, everybody.